So this is problem number six from the 2022 AP Calc BC exam. And as number six always is on the BC exam, this is a question that deals with some series. So they tell us that the function f is defined by this power series. And that holds for all real numbers x for which the series converges. Now in part a, they actually ask us to find the interval of convergence for this power series. So using the ratio test to determine that interval of convergence, uh, remember the ratio test has absolute value, so we don't have to worry about this alternating term when we establish the ratio. But I'm going to check the ratio of the next term, the n plus first term, divided by the current term, or in the case of what you see on my screen, times the reciprocal of the current term, or the nth term. Um, the simplification that can happen here is I have two extra factors of x in this numerator than I have in this denominator. And I can cancel all of these x's with all but two of those x's. So I end up with an x squared sitting in the numerator. Now x squared does not move as n approaches infinity. So I can factor x out of my limit, x squared out of my limit. I do have to keep it in absolute values. I guess since it's squared, we know it's going to be positive anyhow, uh, but that's just the habit that I'm in, always to maintain the absolute values with whatever I remove. And then inside the limit, I'm left with 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. And this limit here is going to be 1, so my end result is going to be the absolute value of x squared times 1. Well, when is the absolute value of x squared less than 1? When is x squared less than 1? If you drop the absolute values, when you solve that, you should be able to identify the interval negative 1 to 1. Now, one of the trickiest things about intervals of convergence like this one, the ratio test tells us that we converge when our limit of this ratio is less than 1. We already know when that happens. We diverge if the limit is greater than 1, but we have no conclusion if our limit is equal to 1. And so what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to be willing to, to take these endpoints, the values that make this an equation, negative 1 and 1 make this an equation rather than an inequality, and we're going to have to plug those into the series and try to figure out what happens manually. So when I plug 1 into the series, let me see if I can make this a little nicer. There we go. So when I plug 1 in place of this x in the series, 1 to whatever this power is is just going to be 1. So I'm basically just left with this. And one thing that you'd have to be careful with, you wouldn't want to call this the alternating harmonic series. It definitely behaves very similarly to the alternating harmonic series. But because of this addition that's happening within the denominator, it's technically not the alternating harmonic series. It is going to be a series that converges by the alternating series test. So that would allow us to include the endpoint of 1 within our interval of convergence. I also have to figure out what's going on at the other endpoint, what's going on at negative 1. So when I plug negative 1 in, this one's a little bit tougher to analyze. I put negative 1 in place of this x right here, and I have negative 1 to the 2n plus 1. But when I look at this numerator, I realize it's multiplication of like bases. And when I multiply like bases, I can add my exponents. Now, this exponent on the negative 1 is one that you have to just kind of think about for a few seconds in order to identify what's going on with it. If n is odd, multiplying by 3 keeps your result odd. But then adding 1 to an odd makes your overall exponent even. So negative 1 to an even is obviously a positive power. Excuse me, a positive 1, excuse me even power, positive 1, when we raise negative 1 to an even power. What happens when I plug an even in? Well, if I plug an even in here, 3 times 2, 3 times 4, 3 times 6, multiplying 3 together with an even is going to leave me with an even number, and then adding 1 to an even number is going to leave me with an odd number. So if my exponent is odd, I do have a negative 1 as this numerator. And so this is still an alternating series. It's, it's technically not equal to the one that we had back here because this one is going to be positive for even values of the index and negative for others. Sorry about that. I noticed that my index that I had represented on these series right here was, was not starting in the right location. Um, my index was supposed to start at zero. So if you're wondering why I kind of just abruptly paused there and then had a little maybe jump in the video. I just wanted to make sure I made that adjustment. Sorry for that uh, at the front end of the video there. Uh, but 
now that that's taken, th this series still converges by the alternating series test. So the conclusion isn't off. It was just this work was technically off a little bit because my index wasn't starting at zero, it was starting at one. Uh, what I was trying to say there and, and what caused me to catch this was that this right here, this numerator is going to be positive when n is odd and negative when n is even. That's the opposite of what this has going on within it. So it's technically not the same exact series that you develop, uh, but it still is a series that converges by the alternating series test. So we would actually be able to include both endpoints in this situation, and our interval of convergence would be negative one to one. I haven't seen the scoring guidelines yet for this. Those won't be released for quite some time. Uh, usually, if you're asked to find an interval of convergence for a power series in a free response question, that's typically worth four or five of the nine points for that particular FRQ. So uh, building the ratio, finding the limit for the ratio, getting the correct interval, and then analyzing the endpoints and developing the correct conclusion, uh, those would typically be what they're looking to see happen if you have a five-point interval of convergence problem. Part B says that we're to show that the absolute value of f of one-half minus one-half is less than 10, and then to justify your answers. So I think, well, I can put one half in place of all of these x's in the series for f of x, and that should give me an idea of maybe where to take this. And after doing that, when you put one half in place of all of these x's, you might notice that f of one half is on the left side of this equation, right? One half going here gives me f of one half on the left, and then the very first term of that series is one half. So the difference between f of one half and one half would be the exact error in approximating f of one half with just the first term of the series. Because this series for f of x is a converging alternating series, the exact error is always going to be smaller than the magnitude of the first omitted term. And the first omitted term would be this guy right here with the exponent of three and the denominator of three. So the absolute value of f of one half minus one half has to be smaller than the magnitude of the first omitted term. So the magnitude of the first omitted term would be the absolute value of this term right here. And if you simplify that term, what you're going to end up seeing that it simplifies to is 1 24th. 1 24th is definitely less than 1 10th. That is it for part B. Part C. I think probably the easiest part of this, write the first four non-zero terms in the general term for an infinite series that represents f prime of x. So if I take the derivative on the left side of this equation that they present us with, I get f prime of x. If I take the derivative of x, I get 1. Multiplying by 3 and subtracting 1 from the exponent causes the times 3 and the over 3 to turn into a coefficient of, well, negative 1, uh, but then a new exponent of 2. Same thing happens here, right? Multiply by 5, which is going to cancel with this 5 leaving you with an exponent of 4 and a coefficient of positive 1. Multiplying by 7 is going to cancel with this 7. Subtracting 1 from the exponent is going to leave you with an exponent of 6, coefficient of negative 1. And then if I apply that here, multiplying by 2n plus 1 is going to allow me to cancel the, what I'm multiplying by with what the denominator is. Subtracting 1 from my exponent is going to leave me with 2n. And then this negative 1 to the n is basically just like a constant that can be copied into that derivative. So there is our series for f prime of x. The last part of this says to use the result from part c to find the value for f prime of 1 sixth. So here was the beginning of my series for part c. Now when I read part d I think okay if I'm trying to find f prime of 1 sixth I better know what this series for f prime of x is. It's either the, the, the Maclaurin series for e to the x, the Maclaurin series for cosine of x, the Maclaurin series for sine of x. It's not any of those. There aren't any factorials involved here at all. So it's not any of those commonly used Maclaurin series. The only other thing that it would potentially be would be a geometric series. And if you think about what happens within a geometric series, I should be able to multiply by a common ratio to get from the first term to the second term. Well, I multiply by negative x squared to get from 1 to negative x squared. If I multiply by that same ratio, by negative x squared, I do get to positive x to the fourth. If I multiply by that same ratio, negative x squared, I do get to negative x to the sixth. So this series for f prime of x, it is a geometric series with common ratio negative x to the second. 
in a geometric series is going to converge as long as you're within the interval of convergence. And the interval of convergence for f was negative 1 to 1. The interval of convergence for this geometric series is also going to be negative 1 to 1. 1 sixth is within that interval of convergence. But if you're within the interval of convergence, you're going to converge to 1, excuse me, the value of the first term, which is 1, divided by 1 minus the common ratio. Uh, so f prime of x is equal to the first term divided by 1 minus the common ratio, which simplifies to this. And so if I want to find f prime of 1 sixth, I just have to put 1 sixth in place of this x in what we just determined f prime of x to be. And there is my value for f prime of 1 sixth. I would say, I mean, if you know where to go with part D, it's not too bad. That's the issue, though. How do you know to go here? I guess it's just the context clue. It's because they're telling you to find this value, you know it's got to either be a series that you should know or a geometric series. In this case, it was geometric. Uh, I think this was fairly straightforward. Uh, part B, I would say, is a little bit goofy. This isn't really phrased in the, the typical sort of way that you would see a, an alternating series airbound question asked, but uh, hopefully the way that we talked about it made a little bit more sense. And then I would say that this is pretty standard. A ratio test uh, to find the interval of convergence is something that happens a decent amount within these FRQs.